this message is for the students. The final essay exam study questions will be posted tomorrow on the B course site. Uh, and when you get back from Thanksgiving on Tuesday, I'll spend a few minutes talking about those questions. You want to make sure you meet with your GSI as soon as you can. Don't forget to bring them flowers, candies, whatever it is that they are going to require to look very kindly on your essay exam, okay? Um, Good afternoon. My name is Alex Zaragoza, and uh, it's my pleasure to greet all of you, especially those of you from the public who are not students. Well, you're young enough to like be a student, but um, uh, very happy that people from the public are here to join uh, the students enrolled uh, in the class. Uh, I want to express my thanks to the art and design program of the University of California, particularly the inspirational leadership of Vice Chancellor Shannon Jackson in putting together this collaboration with the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive. And I especially want to thank the donors that have made this lecture series possible uh, in addition to the funding from various academic units of the University of California at Berkeley. And again, my thanks for those of you from the public uh, who are here to join us. Allow me at this point now to introduce Catherine Rozak, uh, who will introduce our guest speaker today. Thank you, Alex. And uh, I would also like to uh, reiterate special thanks to Shannon Jackson and the whole team and to Alex Zaragoza for putting this wonderful course together. It's been great to be with all of you and to hear your responses and and see some personal transformations taking place. That's the whole goal of this course. So I'd like to introduce today Carla Lucero, uh, a wonderful composer who I've had the honor to work with at our uh, Women Choreographers and Women Composers Residency at the Jurassic Resident Artist Program. We do this annually, and Carla has been a guest there. She's originally from Los Angeles. Her parents are from vastly different cultures, her mother was born and raised in India, and her father is Spanish-American with roots in the New Mexican first Spanish settler colonies. They met and married in the most unexpected of places, Africa. They both have a fierce love for music, especially opera. Carla has memories of listening to Don Giovanni at the age of three while drawing pictures of the other characters in the opera. So this comes very early in Carla's life. Carla spent many years in Los Angeles as the director of music at Hal Roach Studios, as well as composing music for collage dance theater and scoring independent films. She co-founded an all-girl band, Mosaic, playing the Hollywood circuit. And shortly before leaving LA, she co-owned a professional recording studio in the heart of Hollywood, Kitchen Sink Studios. Her deep love of opera brought her back to the city by the bay. And we're going to talk about some of her major operas in a moment, because we'll see them in film clips. We'd like to add that in 2015, she was commissioned by Earplay to write a chamber work, Castillo Interior, Interior Castle. And this was a, uh, an honoring of the writings of Santa Teresa de Avila. Carla was appointed in 2006 to be the U.S. Director of Commune Arte International, an international arts organization for women. And through this organization, her music has been performed around the world in countries such as Mexico, Spain, Italy, Cuba, Chile, and Canada. And I think it's particularly important at this point in time that we hear all voices of all immigrants, and especially women and women who are artists. So now we are going to take a look at the uh, wonderful video that Carla has brought for us. And she's asked me to just give you a brief guide to what you'll be seeing. Uh, you will see excerpts from her first opera, Vornos, which is based on the tragic life crimes and trial uh, by media of America's first female serial killer. The second set of clips are from Carla's third opera, Touch, for which she wrote the music and libretto. It's about the blind, deaf, global icon Helen Keller, and it delves into her turbulent relationship with her mentor, 
Anne Sullivan. The third excerpt is from a workshop production of Sorbonne, which is now going to premiere at UCLA in November 2019. And the music is by Carla, and the libretto is co-written by both Carla and the legendary Chicana writer Alicia Gaspar de Alba. The subject is Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz, the 17th century nun, epic poet, and notorious lesbian feminist badass who met her end at the hands of the Spanish Inquisition. The last clip is Liquid Assets, a collaboration with Collage Dance Theater. Carla wrote and performed this music in 2000, and the performance took place in the fountains of California Plaza, the financial center of Los Angeles. So let's take a look at the clips now. Disappear, this story is unstoppable. 
Is it, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, that was that was terrific. It was such a medley of different work, and I just loved that, that last piece was taking place in the financial center of Los Angeles. Oh yeah, it, <laughs> yeah. It's about the greed and the fall of uh, powerful empires. I think we can all relate, maybe now a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we'd like to see that. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. So uh, let's talk about your focus and your current work because you mentioned when we were talking together that you're looking at rethinking stereotypes, empowering people who are voiceless. <laughs> visible and not seen and not heard. And you've also said that we all have a story and we need to listen to our stories in order to develop understanding. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about your approach right now. Okay, to my current project or yes. my approach in general? Yes, your approach in general and the current project. Okay, so I usually like to focus on um, stories that are not, not really obscure, but stories that I feel need to be told and for some reason or not, either a, a part of the story is never told for political reasons or social taboos. Um, and, and I think that's usually the most interesting you know, part of uh, people's stories. You get to know what motivates them. Um, so I choose, the, the women that I, that I choose uh, to focus my work on, my operas at least, um, are usually women who are who have some some type of status as either icons or as Catherine was talking about some badass you know type of connotation of being feminist. Um, also, uh, sometimes also like with Helen Keller, uh, the opera, the my third opera um, that I'm working on at the very beginning stages now. Um, Helen Keller is probably one of the most misunderstood. Um, American icons, well, she was deaf and, and blind, but a lot of people don't know that she was a prolific writer um, and a, a, a huge member, an active member of the American Socialist Party. So she, um, those are parts of her life that are really interesting, and, and the fact that she had a love affair with one of her... Um,
welcome and welcome her and her mentor and follow them there. She had a very close relationship with Helen Mirren and Helen Keller. And Helen uh, Keller was basically, as they got older, taking care of Anne Sullivan. So they were both at the same time. So anyway, there's, there's a lot to Helen Keller that is uh, compelling and provocative. And she even had an eyes woman or eyeball woman in order to do vaudeville uh, with Anne Sullivan. Her name was Bob. And so it's just, you know, it's, there's a lot of these interesting interesting characters. And I've always admired Helen Keller for obvious reasons. She's been a lot of people and she donates to cancer treatment. She's done, she did it her life uh, with, with it and, you know, without any knowledge of this stuff. Um, my current project, Donna, is based on the 17th century Argentinian poet and wellness and cultural soul of the Americas, um, and also the first uh, written settlement of the Western Hemisphere. We don't, in this country, a lot of people don't know who she is unless you, you're, uh, you know a lot about um, Spanish history or literature, um, or Chicana literature. So uh, she was, she was kind of, for me, kind of an awkward choice because of um, her feelings for the age of her book. Um, she really felt that she was going to be pertinent to the book. Um, uh, poetry, poetry, no, oh, am I back on? Okay. <laughs> she wrote uh, poetry that was published in Spain, which ended up saving her life for, for a couple years. And she eventually went before the Spanish Inquisition. Um, and instead of killing her because she was a celebrity um, in Spain, they sentenced her uh, to uh, a life of taking care of her sisters that had TB. Uh, TB. How do you say it? Tur Tuberculosis. Tu yes. I have a hard time saying that word. So uh, she succumbed to the illness. And before that, they took away all of her writing implements. They burned her books. They um, flogged her publicly. Um, and one of the biggest reasons she was persecuted was because um, of her lesbian um, poetry to the vicerine of, um, of uh, Mexico at that time, coming from Spain. So she, she gave her life for her causes and, and to just to be who she was. Um, she also wrote a lot about uh, the right for women to be able to educate themselves. They were not able to um, during her time. And also about, uh, she wrote about the right of women to express themselves creatively. She even dressed as a boy in order to go to school. So um, I really, uh, her story is just amazing. So that is premiering uh, at UCLA in November 2019. And, it's, a, it's been a long road. It's Spanish language opera, but it's not colloquial Spanish. It's Spanish of the Baroque period. So it had to go through a special translation. It's been an interesting project. Carla, I think it would be great. These are such terrific subjects to talk a little bit more about your background, how you were introduced to music at an early age, and also uh, you had gravitated, you told me, more towards the Mexican part of your culture. Can you say a little bit more about this? And tell us a little bit more about your parents. You told me they live in Mexico and met in the Peace Corps, and your dad uh, couldn't be a professor and support his family, so he went into defense. So let's hear a little bit more about She took background. good notes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my, my parents, as uh, Catherine was saying, my mother was born and raised in India, so I'm first generation uh, on my mother's side. Um, and my father, his, he's many generations here, um, and his roots are in, the, in New Mexico, where there still are these Spanish colonies. So it's a weird mixture. They met in Africa. It's too long of a story to go into, but they, they met in Africa. And I was, there was a question as to wh whether I would be born in Africa, in India, or here in the States. So it could have been um, any of those three places. So they chose uh, the United States. So here I am. Uh, <laughs> um, so 
what, uh, what got me into music, I, I don't think I got into music, music got into me. Um, I was musical from birth, pretty much. And my parents listened to a really wide range of music, uh, but opera was the common denominator. We, opera was playing in the house a lot. And at that time, um, they were LPs, right? Albums, and there, there, were, there would be these books with pictures of, of the characters, and I was fascinated by this. So I think in my little mind at that time, I put together that music is this great vehicle to, to tell stories with. So I think I made that connection very early. Um, but unfortunately, because I'm a woman at that time, uh, a little girl, um, all that was known to, to, uh, to do you know, with your child, your, your girl child, would be to give them piano lessons or maybe the violin lessons, right? Those two, or maybe flute, right? So I, uh, I, w I would beg to take piano lessons. So I started at four, and then I was on my way to becoming a concert pianist, and I knew in the back of my mind this was not for me, but I, I knew that you know, this was a way to be musical that my parents you know, approved of and loved, and I was like the little uh, they would, you know, trot me out during their parties to play, you know, the piano, and then, you know, and I was very, very shy as a child. I still am, believe it or not. I have some students here who probably can't believe that, but yes, yeah, <laughs> I was, I was very shy. Um, so, I started writing little pieces uh, on the piano, and so I knew how to read music before I knew how to read words. By the way, I'm dyslexic. So the music became really a vehicle for my mother actually to teach me how to spell. Um, so it's always been a really valuable tool to me, not just, um, um, and a comfort, not just a way to express myself. So anyway, fast forward to college. Uh, I entered college as a piano major. So I was a piano major at CalArts. And knowing full well, I didn't tell my parents but that I was gonna change my major, or at least try to, uh, to change it to composition. And I had no, because I was a girl, I never had any lessons in theory, music theory. It was all technical, you know, how to play the piano, but no connection to the theoretical um, parts of it, of music. So I had to really work hard in order to change my major, so I audited, um, uh, first year composition courses uh, and submitted my portfolio without telling my parents, by the way, that by the way, I'm gonna you know, change my major. I didn't tell them until I was accepted. They said, yes, you know, you're accepted into the program. And as a second year student, I was thrilled because I was thinking, oh my God, they're gonna make me repeat my first year. My parents are really gonna freak out, right? But I got into, into the second, as a second year student and uh, I called my parents to tell them, thinking they be, would be happy, I don't know. And I said, you know, I, I, I found the real me, you know, <laughs> this is what I want to do, this is what I've always wanted to do. They're like, huh? I changed my major, I'm going to be a composition major next year. My mother, swear, swear to you, said, I'm going to kill myself. And I thought, wow, that wasn't the reaction I was expecting. Expecting. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that my mother, being born and raised in India, you know, we grew up really with a pretty strict Indian upbringing, uh, that it was not, you know, a composer, a female composer. What is she thinking? Like, I think my, my mother thought I went crazy. Um, and, you know, she said, oh my God, you know, all those years of piano. Of, of course, I still you know, reap the benefits of having all of that training, but I'm doing exactly what I, what I want to do. My father was an easier sell, so, you know, he, he understood more, I think, about, about that process, but it did come up, like, we've never heard of any woman composer. And I said, well, you know, they're, they're out there, and I've, you know, in my women's studies class, I learned about them. But I mean, in terms of being uh, in um, uh, being in, the, in school as a composition major, there were no 
examples of female composers, none. Also, Latino composers, I'm not even gonna say Latina, because they, would, I mean, they were not, they were completely invisible. Uh, so anyway, so that's how that happened, and, and I don't know if I, it's great. It's, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's a very challenging story, and then I'd like to fast forward a little bit and ask how you got into opera, because there was a period after you were in school where you were very involved in LA, mm -hmm. and you're still involved in teaching film scores. But you told me that in film, the stories are more limited, that they were kind of uh, truncated, but that opera gives you the depth to tell stories of oppressed people that need several layers. So tell us about how you got into opera. Yeah, absolutely. So I just wanted to backtrack, but okay. one thing. Um, actually, as a piano, I mean, as a composition major, I was the only woman in my, my graduating class. So um, it, was, it was really, really challenging in that way, too, because my fellow students, the, uh, the men in my class, would, you know, go uh, vacillate between being really patronizing or very hostile if they sensed any competition. So it was really rough. College was very rough for me. And you were the only person of color as well. Yeah, and the only person this of color. In the 80s. It's that's like I was, I was, I told Catherine, I felt like a unicorn. You know, it's like, oh, look, oh, that's interesting. So, <laughs> yeah, how cute. Uh, <laughs> so af after your uh, major, uh, we were gonna just segue into you know, uh, okay. how opera is so important for you because you get to go much more in depth into these stories. Yeah, I I actually so after I uh, graduated from college, I became the director of music for a movie studio, film studio, uh, Hal Roach Studios in Hollywood, and I was there for a while and. Um, Again, it was rare to actually have a position like that, and it, listen to this, students, it came out of an internship. So I started, I had an internship, and uh, the year that I graduated, my boss, who was the director of music of the studio, said, hey, I'm leaving my job, do you want my job? I was like, hell yes, I want your job. So I, I, I started there, and I realized that this actually was not, uh, it was good, I did it for a while, I did my job well, I enjoyed it for what it was for a while, but I wasn't satisfied creatively. So I did a lot of different things. I started an all-girl band, played the Hollywood circuit, scored uh, independent films, and um, uh, was a choreographer, resident composer for a dance company in LA. And that was from that clip that you saw at the end. Um, so. It was really, uh, it was like for me going from one boys club to another uh, with the Hollywood, the whole Hollywood scene. Also, when I had, and then I had a recording studio, I co-owned it, and it was actually quite famous. We, we recorded like uh, Concrete Blonde, Ice-T, um, Coolio, who else do I have on, on there? I've, there's lots of people. But this is when like Death Row Records was coming up and Interscope and so it was all rap and super misogynist. I mean, if I can't count the times I heard the C word, you know, in the studio and, and just, just really kind of a verbal violence um, against women and that wears on you, you know, that wasn't worth the money. So I had this thought in the back of my head, always I want to, to compose an opera. I really want to. And I knew actually that this would have to come to me, like the story would have to come to me. Um, so in the studio at, at Kitchen Sink, I, uh, we, got, we got magazines and I looked at this Vanity Fair uh, article and it was called Hooker with a Heart of Gold. And I read about it, it was the story of Eileen Warnos. And it was so layered, you know, because what I had been seeing on, on television the media was this picture of her always like in handcuffs and scowling and, and uh, just looking like the monster they wanted to portray her as. With no backstory, nothing. And we knew she was a prostitute, highway hooker, the whole nine yards. And I read this article and it was so detailed. And it went into her backstory and it really touched my heart because for me it was obvious this is, this is a consequence of an unhealed life. 
um, is also she's a woman. How many times has she been raped? You know, and, and it ended up that the first, the f her first uh, killing was of a man who had served 10 years uh, as a serial rapist, and he was released, and they met on the highway. He was a truck driver, and they, uh, he tried to kill her, and she, she, he was a first um, uh, victim. So after that, in my, uh, my thought, my, my theory is that her whole idea of what was self-defense pretty much moved after that. Um, uh, I think in a lot, a lot of times people who have experienced trauma, if you know, they're going through this trauma over and over again and they're not speaking out and suddenly they do or they act out, that is kind of a reclaiming of their self. So uh, I think after that she became a little bit too gung-ho because there were six victims after that. But I think it was, it was definitely a product of her uh, abuse. So that was part of her story. And then there was a whole media circus. And then she was adopted by a born-again Christian woman and, a, and a, was, was represented by a late-night TV lawyer. It was just too much for me to pass up. So I thought, how, how would this be? You know, I was thinking in terms of film. This is before Monster, the movie Monster came out. In fact, I consulted on that project, on that film project, that movie. But this was this predated the, the movie. So um, I thought opera would be the perfect vehicle for it. So no lie, I quit the studio, just like that. And I took off for a year. Uh, my parents retired in Mexico, so I said, hey, can I crash with you guys for a while and, and you know, knock out a draft, a first draft of this uh, libretto and some musical examples? They said, sure, and so I did it, and I said, the only place that I can get this uh, produced would be San Francisco. So I moved to San Francisco without a plan. I just knew I had to get this, this uh, opera produced, and within three months I found a producer, and, um, yeah, so it happened. But it turns out that, that the movie that I consulted on, Monster, when it came out a couple of years later, I was so disappointed because they didn't delve into her history. Like, what motivates a person to do this? It's not like she woke up one day and decided to start killing people. You know, what was the motivation? So um, uh, I was disappointed uh, by that. So I knew that I had chosen the right medium to tell her story to get to hear in a few moments. Um, in addition to the video, we're going to actually go through some music clips. But before we do that, I want to come back to your parents and your personal journey, because you shared with me some of what happened when you came out, um, that your parents sent you to a priest and to a psychiatrist, yeah. and that you actually came out very publicly in the San Francisco Chronicle. Right. And they said, if the whole world accepts you, then we accept you. But it took that much. So perhaps you can tell us about this part of your journey. Yeah. That's, it's, it's a painful... It was a really painful part of my life because, um, you know, I was out to my friends and in L.A., when you're in the industry, it's kind of tricky uh, because people will step all over you if they can or use whatever, whatever information they have about you to prevent you from, from getting a job. So I also thought San Francisco would be so much more freeing because I could be who I am. So I came out to my family and I was instantly rejected. And that was before I actually, uh, actually before I moved to San Francisco. And they were not happy. My father told me he could never accept a gay daughter. Um, very painful stuff. My mother sent me to a priest uh, and then a psychiatrist. So uh, it was a whole rejection of a, of a, a big part of me. And, and it's very, it could be, you know, I, th I think that I started to become a little bit self-destructive at that time. And I quickly reined it in and uh, just dealt with them. And, now, and then uh, I did an uh, interview for the San Francisco Chronicle, and they point blank asked me. And I said, yep, I'm lesbian. And they, they you know, there I was on the front page of the pink section with, lesbian composer, blah, 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 right? And I thought, you know what? I'm going to send this to my parents in Mexico. Just, it's not even worth a phone call. I'm going to send it. 
I sent it off to them, and I got a call from my both of them on, on the line, and they said, you know what, Carla, if the whole world can accept you, we can accept you. That was like another like punch in the gut to me, because it's like, I'm still the same person, you know, why couldn't you accept me, you know, as I was, you know, as I am without this validation from the rest of the world, really San Francisco, right? So, so um, after that though, and this was many years ago, I have a great relationship with my parents. They come to pride that my mother like wants to like, she's disabled, but she wants to be in the P flag cont contingent and all of these things. So there was closure. Uh, so, you know, things are good, but it was very painful, uh, very painful journey for me. Well, we want to have some time to now segue from your personal journey back into your music. Uh, Carla wants to share some of her audio clips with you, so we'll get ready to do that. And what we're going to hear is a recording of the Mexico City Philharmonic performing the overture and prologue from Vornos, which was the tale of the female serial killer. And then we will hear some piano solo work from that same opera performed by the legendary Cuban pianist Ninauska Fernandez Brito for the Latin American label Murmuelos de Serenas. Murmuelos de Sirenas. Thank you. <laughs> um, the third piece is Grace, and that's from the ear play performance of uh, Carla's Castillo Interior, Interior Castle. And this features the male soprano Randall Wong, and this is based on the mystical writings of Saint uh, Teresa de Avila. And then we will have uh, some further excerpts at the end from Juana for string orchestra, and this was recorded in Chile last year. And perhaps you would like to say the name of the orchestra. Oh, just Orquesta Marga Marga. It's a string orchestra. So I was asked to to uh, create a string orchestra version for uh, performance of one of the pieces in in Juana. I also wanted to say the the second is it Castillo Interior the second. Yes. Okay, so that second one. If the voice sounds kind of weird, it's not weird. It's a certain type of singer. It's a countertenor, um, actually a male soprano. So he even uh, sings higher and with more of a uh, quality to his voice that sounds a lot more like a woman, but you will be able to hear the difference um, in that. Yes, so just uh, so that you can hear again, we're going to do uh, Vuernos, followed by uh, the Teresa de Avila Castillo interior, followed by Juana. So let's take a listen.
me interject a question um, to you, Carla. Um, you mentioned how you came to San Francisco in part because of the artistic space, in a manner of speaking, that you thought might be here. Um, and in the case of Los Angeles, I would argue that that space has, has expanded, uh, et cetera. But I was wondering um, about the artistic space in general available to artists in general, regardless of race, creed, color, sexual orientation. Um, and that that space, perhaps for women in particular, especially uh, people uh, of gay or transgender orientations and so on, do you feel that space has grown and expanded since you started your career? Or are, are those spaces still, in a sense, like bubbles, if you will, where there's a lot of space outside that is, to put it gently, less accommodating? Uh, uh, of nurturing uh, an, artistic, uh, an artistic space uh, of the sort that you were seeking when you came to San Francisco? Uh, yes, I, well, I just think there's more bubbles. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's been like an, a full-on inter integration, you know, of, of women, people of color, uh, LGBTQ people, all of that, I think we're still super marginalized. And uh, the more boxes you check, the more marginalized you are. Right. In that space. Exactly. Uh, so I think th there's just more bubbles. And then interestingly enough, I actually got more interest um, and, and integration into programs uh, that were, you know, that featured male composers, living and dead, um, in Mexico, Chile, uh, Uruguay too, um, and Spain, because they were just, it, it didn't seem to be like uh, this whole um, like ghettoizing, you know, of, of people who are not uh, of that same, you know, white male or, or male, straight male uh, category. So um, yeah, I think here we have a long way to go because it's, it's kind of, we, we have these bubbles as women, you know, gay, straight, whatever, as LGBTQ people, as people of color, um, we have these different bubbles. And uh, one of the, I think one of the interesting things is that, you know, San Francisco, Berkeley, um, these, are all, these are kind of meccas for, for ex acceptance, in integration, um, it's much more progressive than, than uh, a lot of places in the United States. Also, this whole idea that we're going backwards is just terrifying. Um, so I think um, the, more that these, the more that these bubbles can expand is, is probably more important than having more bubbles. You had wanted me to sort of open up uh, before we go to everybody else's Q&A uh, with this question, what is your advice for young women going into the arts? Okay, and I'm gonna also ex expand that to is young women, people of color, LGBTQ people, people just in general who are marginalized. Concentrating though on women, because that's, because I'm a woman. Um, so I think it's really important that, you know, you always, it sounds cliche, but it's so true, you have to follow your dreams, but you have to follow your dreams in a smart way um, and a kind way. You know, we cannot, uh, as women, attack each other because we're of different, we belong to these different bubbles. You know, we lose a lot of power when we attack each other. Um, that's why I was talking about expanding these bubbles. Um, so my advice is to follow your dreams and to be kind to one another so that we can all be empowered with our own stories and our voices. Great, so I think we want to open this up to everybody's questions at this point. I see one up there. Wait a minute, we're gonna bring a microphone to you so everyone can hear your question. Hi, how do you be kind to each other when the window is so narrow and then the competition's so fierce and the nature of that setup 
makes you try to like, you know, be like a crab in a bucket or something like that. That's like kind of my first part question, but <laughs> I had a second part question, which is totally different. Do you, want, do you want me to answer the first part? Yeah. Okay, so I look at it like this. So as people who are marginalized in general, there's this piece of pie, right, or this whole pie. And the more that we try to divide it and stop people, other people from, from joining in, uh, the less effective it is. You know, we're going to splinter this pie in so many ways. I think, I think what needs to happen is, you know, I see people, people attacking each other because they're not of the same culture or, you know, uh, you know or gender or orientation or gender identity. All of this, all of this stuff uh, becomes toxic and that's what you're talking about, how these doors are closed. I think if anything, these doors need to be opened and more inclusive of everybody that is part, you know, part of this pie, or who are going to take take a, a piece of this pie. I think that the buy-in should be that you're going to include everybody that's that's included in that all the marginalized people. That's why I'm saying the bubbles. We don't need more bubbles. We need to expand those bubbles. So that's what I'm talking about. I think it's counterproductive if we t attack each other. Definitely. Um, my second question is uh, totally off from that, but um, it's about the liquid acids uh -huh. that you did. Um, uh, it sounded like synthesizers. Yeah. So um, I was just going to, um, what kind of synthesizers were they? Why'd you choose them? And also, are there operas that are based around electronic music and how are they accepted? Are they like frowned upon or are there something like? More, more possibilities out there? Those are actually really good questions. So the first one, um, I used, God, I had a whole rack of stuff, like a, a DX7, of course, right? That's how old uh -huh. I am. A DX7, I had um, a Roland, I don't remember what it was, it was a rack of all uh, analog stuff. Mm. Uh, and a Moog. Yeah. And uh, so, and that wasn't an opera, that was a dance production. So some of it I was playing live, some of it I had programmed. And in that time, we didn't have Sibelius or Finale, you know, it was Cubase. So I used that as a sequencing program. And I played and there were lo lots of live cues um, that I had to deal with, as you saw, it was so crazy. That whole thing was crazy. And there were pyrotechnics and everything, so I had to make sure that there were explosion sounds at certain times and you know and then when they're walking through the water or they're dancing in the water whatever to make sh making sure that the the music was matching what they were doing but there's a deep collaboration that happens before that but unfortunately we didn't get a uh, a rehearsal while the fountains were hap you know in place so we really had to just imagine you know what was happening and we had these timed sequences and if they didn't la last as long as I that, that you know, as I figured, it was on to the next you know sequence. It was it was really really tough. Um, and in terms of uh, synthesizers and opera, I know that sometimes uh, orchestras in general are are supplemented by by um, electronic instruments and synthesizers. There's actually somebody here who would know a little bit more. Dirk Epperson, he's a colleague of mine and dear friend. Do you know of any operas that uh, feature prominently synthesizers? Okay. Okay. So some. So it's just an electroacoustic. Now that's pretty much of what I'm aware of too. Like electroacoustic um, productions. Not. I don't know of any that are just solely electronic. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank okay. you. Just a question if I hear from you. Yeah. Question if I hear from you. Thank you, Felix. Um, when the LA Opera um, put on uh, Akhenaten, there was a lot of backlash that the main character was cast, I think he was a counter-tenor, but he, it was cast, um, the character Akhenaten 
uh, is Egyptian, but the, 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 the singer playing it was white. And there was um, controversy around that. And then I think the production company said that their uh, hiring method was that they only considered um, talent and basically was race blind. Um, do you think that in opera, that's the, the best approach to, um, for, to, to think about representation? Oh, that's kind of a loaded question because being a composer, I want the best performance of my work, but I think for a premiere, in fact, for what's happening at UCLA now, um, we're also doing this in conjunction with LA Opera. So we're hoping that, uh, that the net is not cast so widely because I want Latino uh, singers primarily for the main roles. Uh, so I've, that's been my request for different reasons, and be mostly because it's a premiere, and I want to represent uh, Latinos in this, and instead of, of having uh, people that are not Latino represent Latino culture. So um, that's, my, that's very important to me. But in terms of what happens afterwards, so what happens with, with the projects like this, so after the premiere, I actually have nothing to do with it. Then it's then I license out the work and it's performed in different places. So then I have no control over that. Um, but for the premiere, because I have control over it, it's going to be very important to me that um, that I have Latino, primarily Latino singers, especially for the main roles. Um, yeah, I always, I even for the 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 workshop productions of Juana before. Uh, in San Francisco, that was the main thing we were looking for. Um, and also, it's when you're telling a story that's so important to so many people, it's really important to honor um, the authenticity um, and and um, just you know people are seeing this and they're they're relating to it on one level or another. And Sor Juan is a great source of pride for Latin America. So. Yeah, that we're going to do our best, at the very least. So Juana, her love interest, and one of the clergy members that has a really big part will be Latino. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, Kara. Hi, Ada. Uh, you, uh, my question is about opera. And when you write an opera, do you write the lyrics for yourself? Yes, I do. For uh, Warnos, I wrote both the libretto and the uh, music, so I did all of that one. Uh, for Touch, Helen Keller, all of that one. For Wana, the, the project now, I'm co-writing the words, the, the text for the libretto, um, with the author of the book that the, the opera is based on. Alicia Gaspar de Alba, and uh, it's a really good question. By the way, Ada is an opera singer, so, and one of my students. Um, I so one of the one of the things that kind of became difficult with this. So I'm used to kind of coming up with the idea, doing everything you know myself, and but I came across this book, and uh, it just blew my mind. I thought, oh my God, this is my next opera, right? So I called her up, cold called her. Said I and I seriously closed the book. I said I have to base my next opera on on this book. Called her and told her what I wanted to do, and she she said yes. And she said I'll do even better. I'll co-write the libretto with you. Um, that's one of the reasons it took so long, though, because we don't live in the same city. So we were trying to write it, you know, hundreds of miles away. It would come together sometimes, you know to to fine tune a, a draft and so it it was it's it's much more difficult to do it that way but i think the product is really really good cuz she knows she's a scholar in uh, about sorwana so um yeah so this is a first for me co-writing uh, the libretto that's a lot of work <laughs> yes that's why opera takes years you know to to Come to life. When did you start working on that Sorvana? Wasn't it 2003, maybe? So 2003, I started working on it. Then uh, we had a, a workshop production, 2007. 
And what we found out is that people in this country, a lot of people, don't know who Sor Juana is. And it was a hard sell. It's Spanish language opera, somebody people, most people don't know about. Um, so there, we realized there had to be an educational component around it to educate people about who she is and to see how important she is to so many people, not just women, not just Latinos, but just, I mean, she's the first great poet of the Americas. Even for historians. Yes. Like myself. Yeah. I, so, so I was just going to say, though, that um, we put it to sleep right after 2007. So 2007, we're like, I, I, I would feel guilty walking into my studio and seeing the music I'd written for the workshop, and I would tell her, don't worry, Sarwana, it'll happen, you know, while I'm working on you know, my other projects. And then we, Alicia and I got a call uh, to the, about UCLA being interested in, um, in the opera. So then we went right back to work in 2016, like we hadn't even taken a break. But it was, it was a long break, like nine years, and then we started again. Weren't they seeking a work by a woman composer? Yes, they're seeking a work by a woman composer, and they want it, wanted it to be uh, primarily Latino because of a lot of, because of what's happening now and to raise awareness about a very powerful uh, Latina icon. If, if I may ask a follow-up question, um, I was sharing with my students in the last lecture about the um, uh, deterioration of funding uh, for the National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities. Even here in California, we've yet to, in a sense, reach the high of support for the California Humanities Council, et cetera. I'm wondering, as, uh, as a working artist, the, the significance, or not, uh, of that trend. It, are there sources that compensate, if you will, for the loss of that kind of funding? Uh, and is that part of the bubble effect, uh, if you will? I was wondering if you would, might respond to that question. Sure. Um, in terms of the NEA, uh, yeah, uh, w we lost a lot of um, support for, that's one of the reasons why I want to went to sleep as well. Uh, we were used to getting funding from like the Creative Work Fund and uh, different uh, entities that are funded directly by the NEA. So that source of funding started to, to dry up quite a bit. And you know, when you are uh, uh, requesting money from the NEA, the symphony gets that money, the, a big, huge part of it. Uh, the, the San Francisco Opera gets a huge part of it. So they end up, these big institutions, which, by the way, have never had uh, an opera on their stage composed by a woman. Never. To this day. Okay, so they're sucking up a lot of the funding. Probably going to get a lot of flack for this, but they suck up a lot of the, the funding. and. And uh, there was just less of that pie we were talking about. It, that pie just got way smaller. And then when there was a, the uh, recession, um, s the money just fell out, um, you know, uh, for, for funding of, of projects, let alone anything slightly controversial. Everything just kind of dried up. So uh, I was very fortunate because I, in San Francisco, I had people who were very interested in my work who were actually in the corporate world. So that's why the thanking Schwab and Wells Fargo and all of these um, corporations that normally we, we would hate, they actually ended up plugging in uh, some money, putting some money in uh, where these corporations, uh, I mean the organizations, nonprofits kind of dried up. So we had to rely a lot on the private sector I also wanted to add before we go back into the questions that, uh, you know, to echo with the other major arts organizations, it's uh, equally a sad story because with uh, San Francisco Ballet, uh, they can go 10 years with their seasons and maybe have one or two women artists. I think we were counting up the number of opportunities, you know, because they're triple bills, not just full length, but, you know, there might be 500 slots over a number of years. and. I think less than five of them had been occupied over, you know, many decade period by female 
artists. So it's a very woman-dominated field in a way because women are very visible, they're highly visible, but they're not in leadership roles. So that's part of you know the project that Carla and I, the one that I direct in Woodside at the Jirasi Resident Artist Program, but this is very important for women choreographers and composers so that they can be better supported and more visible. But let's see if there's any more questions. Can, can you wait for the mic? Yeah, Carla, you were talking about private sector funding. Have you experienced any push, any uh, desire for artistic control from the, art, from the private sector? Or is it, here's the money, do what you want? Both. <laughs> Both. I would say that, that usually there aren't strings attached in terms of uh, them wanting any type of artistic control. I'd say that it's usually how it is. But we've, I've experienced people who, like, let me co-write this with you, or, you know, I know, you know, my aunt, or whatever, right? So that's kind of, it's kind of a difficult thing to navigate. So uh, a lot of times, um, it's better to go to these, these uh, to corporate funders when you have done a lot of the work already, so that they can see that you're, you know, you have this trajectory, that you've already started it, and, and there isn't room for that type of thing. Yeah. Um, hi, so my name is Bo, and I was wondering, as someone who's not necessarily involved in the arts, um, like how, you talk about how you're advocating for all these, um, basically like, just movements that you said, like where we need to be expanding the bubbles, where we need to maybe like be reconsidering the way that we're distributing money, like in government, um, with the arts. How do I advocate for some of these changes as someone who's not necessarily involved in this area? I guess so adv advocating for people who are marginalized. Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, bless you, first of all. Um, I, I think people in, in marginalized uh, uh, communities call people like you allies. You would be an ally. Um, and it's get involved, you know, say, I'm, I, these are my skills. Um, are you an artist, by the way? Okay. So if your skills, say, are, are web design or you're good with accounting or you're, you know, will, you're, good at designing or whatever it is, the door is always open, you know, for, for people to advocate and, and also word of mouth, publicity, all of that stuff. Um, it's, I think sometimes it's even more powerful coming from somebody who's not a part of that group. It's almost like validation. You've heard of the, the, um, the saying, preaching to the choir. Um, this is, it's really powerful for, for men for, for people who are not of color, um, straight people. I, I all have all of that in my community, all of those types of people in my community who promote my work, who ha see value in it, and um, they're very actively involved. So it's basically going to, see, going to uh, performances, say, right? Workshop performances. And, and then figuring, seeing if you see that there's A, uh, artistic value in it, and then B, what's the importance, the social justice importance you know, piece of it, and then make yourself available. And uh, I think if you approach somebody, they're not gonna say no. They're, they're gonna really appreciate it. I think it's wonderful. We need more people like you. I'm gonna ask one, one more question because I do a lot of interviews in my work and I want to loop all the way back in a manner of speaking to the beginning when you were three and heard Don Giovanni or whatever it was. How is it that your parents became so enmeshed in music where you would be listening to things like that at such a young age and nurtured you at least from the standpoint of providing the piano lessons and so on? Did they come from a musical tradition themselves? Uh, if you will, because it seems to me 
that if that's not the case, it, it, in a sense, your ascent uh, it, it depended in part on that accident that your parents, for whatever reason, loved the music. I wonder if you might talk a bit about your own parents' love of music and how it was that they were playing Don Giovanni for you at age three. Well, I, uh, my parents are just huge music lovers. Every time they're here, we try to go to an opera or something. Um, my dad took a course in opera appreciation when he was in college, and he said it changed his life. He understood it before he thought, oh my God, you know, opera is horrible. Ew, I don't understand it. It's, you know. So he took a course in opera appreciation uh, as an elective course and, and fell in love with it. So that got him into opera. So that was an accident. That was a Probably total, some requirement. You have to take an art class and total so Total accident. Um, so then my, my mother, um, in India, she lived across the street from an opera singer, a very famous opera singer. And uh, she would sing and rehearse. And my mother said she would just sit on the steps her, of her porch and just listen to to this woman sing um, opera, and finally got the guts to tell her mother, actually, to tell her mother that, oh my God, I'm so moved by this, it's so beautiful. And so uh, she was introduced to, to the opera singer, and they, um, uh, the opera singer let her attend all of her shows for free. So my mother came from a very poor family. So she got to go to these, these uh, opera concerts and uh, opera productions. So that's, my mom just loved it. So when my parents met in Africa, they would be playing opera constantly, and they knew the stories of the operas. So it was kind of, you know, when I grew up, that was like the first thing I was listening to, and it was normal for me. And my dad would explain the stories, and then show me the picture books, and I was fascinated by it. So like I said, I, I really made the connection that music, is a great vehicle to tell stories by. And it just seemed natural for me, really natural. So two accidents came together in, in, in that respect. Oh yeah, definitely. We also listened to a lot of Indian music <laughs> at home, uh, flamenco and even rock, but opera was the main thing. Well, thank you very much to all of you for your presence, I really appreciate it. Round of applause, please, for Carla Lucetta. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure she'll stick around if there's any individual questions anybody wants to make.